Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, so that last one, uh, the retreat, um, was insane. That was a crazy video. Um, well done, like always, Epic History TV. Go check them out. Original video down in the description below. Uh, thanks again, LightX7, for the info and uh, for the uh, next video. Uh, so let's do it. Um, let's get right into it. If you're not subscribed, go ahead and click that button. Love for you to join us, learn about history. And let's do it. All right. Uh, the road to Leipzig. Leipzig. Leipzig? Yeah, one of those. All right, let's do it. Maybe none of them. Maybe I mispronounced it three times. Eighteen twelve had been a disastrous year for Napoleon. His invasion of Russia had led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. Now Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. Some advised Emperor Alexander that this was the time to make a favorable peace with Napoleon. Russia's own armies had been mauled and Western Russia devastated. But Alexander was determined to see Napoleon defeated for good to free Europe from his clutches and avenge Moscow's destruction by taking Paris. Napoleon's allies were deserting him. Prussian troops had already agreed a truce with the- The taste of blood is in the water and now all, you know, the big shark is, is wounded and now all the other sharks are smelling the blood and ready to pounce. Schwarzenberg's corps marked the agreed a truce with the Russians. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria. Hold on, hold on. The Russians deserting him. Prussian troops had already agreed a truce with the Russians. Okay, okay. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria, which assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the army, but he left for the Kingdom of Naples, hoping to cut a deal with the Allies that would let him keep his throne. He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson, Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, but was unused to independent command, and now faced odds of four to one. As Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat west, leaving garrisons to hold strategic fortresses, most of which were soon besieged. On the 7th of February, Russian troops entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's Polish client state, the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. Three weeks later, Russian troops entered Berlin, while Sweden joined the Allies. Sweden was ruled by Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte, now officially known as Crown Prince Karl Johan. Many would accuse. Accuse him of betraying Napoleon, but he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's Crown Prince, he'd pursue Swedish interests, which is what he now claimed to do. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and one million pounds from Britain, Bernadotte agreed to join what was now the sixth coalition against France since the revolution, with an army of 30,000 troops. Okay, these are the coalitions. Right. See, at the beginning, I didn't realize, you know, this. I just started off this whole thing with uh, a playlist on here, Napoleon, um, the Napoleonic Wars one through six, but I didn't realize that there were uh, more before it, so I, I didn't technically get to see these first few, and I forget exactly which one. But anyways, if you go to the uh, playlist on Epic History TV and you see and you go, it has I think twenty five videos. Um, the Napoleonic Wars one through six isn't at the top. And so I didn't see these first ones. I think I'll go back and watch those after all this is done, though. So, yeah. 
Ten days later, King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. It followed weeks of indecision. The king was widely seen as a weak character and terrified of Napoleon. But with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial and material aid from Britain, he agreed to field an army of 80,000 men. On the 17th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany, and mein Volk, to my people, summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's honor in what would soon be known as the German War of Liberation. The Prussian army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. A military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished flogging, expanded recruitment, and introduced exams for officers, and overhauled training, tactics, and drill. When Napoleon met the new Prussian army in battle two months later, he remarked, these animals have learned something. Small consolation, they'd learned most of it from him. This video is sponsored by Griffith. I wish I had a sponsor. <laughs> That's the way she goes. As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris, working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. 137,000 new conscripts joined the army, and laws passed to call up 100,000 more while 40,000 veterans from the army in Spain, 16,000 Marines, and 80,000 men of the National Guard, a home defense force, were transferred to Germany. The new conscripts were nicknamed Marie Louises, after Napoleon's young wife, who passed the new conscription laws in his absence. They were young and raw. Two thirds were teenagers and there was a severe lack of experienced officers and NCOs. In short, the countless irreplaceable veterans now lying beneath Russian soil. There was also a critical shortage of cavalry, a crisis mocked by British satirists. Good. I love how that humor can still stick today. <laughs> what do you mean we don't have a cavalry? Look right over there. Are those there? <laughs> Sorry. It would take Napoleon longer to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who perished in Russia. When Napoleon left Paris for Germany in mid-April, the French situation was precarious. Eugène had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. The duchy of Mecklenburg-Schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine. Russian Cossacks raided as far as Hamburg, inspiring local revolts against French occupying forces. Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines, so far declining to back either side. Napoleon's miraculous feat of organization meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. And the emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his army was high. 
The Russians, on the other hand, lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal Kutuzov, to pneumonia on the 28th of April. Kutuzov! His role was taken over by General Wittgenstein. Russian troops were exhausted and far from home. Their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. Prussia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilize their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered 100,000 men. They were now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon, and the French Emperor decided to strike quickly. He ordered Marshal Davout to Hamburg, with 35,000 men, to secure his northern flank. It seemed like things were done for Napoleon, like, like you're, you're screwed, and he might still be, but, I mean, he marshaled together, a, or mustered together a good force. He yeah. would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies, allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, and re-establish his dominance over Europe. It's a good quote. And I love how uh, like he's trying to make Austria-Hungary think twice about joining uh, the um, coalition against him. It's, it's sort of like there's been like this bully that like you're sort of the friend but the subordinate of and then he's kind of fallen a little bit from grace and so you're having that second thoughts but then he like he looks at you one more time and he's like if I beat them you're done. And so it's kind of hard for someone like Austria Hungary to be like oh what side do I pick? I don't know who's going to win. As Napoleon advanced on Leipzig the Allies faced a predicament. To risk battle against Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight, a potentially devastating blow to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts, that their own troops were better trained and had a I have a question about the allies. Um, the term allies, like in World War II, the ally, allies versus the Axis or whatever. Is allies, is that like a term um, designated by the armies in this kind of coalition army or the allies? Or is that just like a, a friendly term? Like to the other side, they would be the allies? I'm sorry if that's kind of confusing. If you knew what I asked right there, then if you could answer. Great superiority if you didn't, then in forget cavalry it. and artillery. The Allies agreed that as Napoleon crossed the Sala River, they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces. The two armies were on a collision course. But Napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements. About the men on... <laughs> on the 1st of May, Marshal Bessier, commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself when he was hit by a cannonball and killed instantly. Bessier... Cannonballs are terrifying. I mean... I'm speaking from someone who's never been near a cannonball or a cannon when it fires an actual. But I, I just, it's probably a, always a quick death, almost always. I know there's that guy who got hit in the shoulder. But just like more, just seeing your, your fellow soldier or friend, or whatever, get taken out by a cannonball must be so jarring. Pierre was the second of Napoleon's marshals to be killed in action. And like Lan, an old comrade and trusted friend. The Allies were able to surprise Napoleon, falling on Marshal Ney's third corps near Lutzen. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught, while Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. 
one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined Prussian assaults. But on the whole, his young conscripts fought... I don't know if that's... I'm sorry to pause again so quickly, but I don't know if that's a, a boost of morale or a, or a kill to morale, seeing, like, Napoleon, if you're a soldier. It's like, oh my god, it's Napoleon, but it's like, wait a second, that's Napoleon. What's he doing so close to the... So close to the battle, are we screwed? So, it, like, is it a heroic act or an act of, of? Uh, oh my God, what's the word? Not coward. Necessity, like, um, I forget the word. You know what I mean? With courage, but despite hours of savage fighting, Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement, though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, losing just half as many men. General von Scharnhorst, mortally wounded. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement, though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties losing just half as many men. General von Scharnhorst, mortally wounded, was among them. Crucially, Napoleon's lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin, Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, while he continued east. But the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, deliberately close to the Austrian border, hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene, and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. Neither happened. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south, to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. The battle lasted two days, as French infantry struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders caused a delay that allowed the Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's trap. Once more, the Allies fought with great determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. There were more casualties during the pursuit, including the next day, General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace, responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements and his closest surviving friend. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. His slow shot rick riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. His slow, painful death deeply upset Napoleon. The Emperor continued his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack of experienced cavalry, while Oudinot was sent north to take Berlin but was held at Lakau by von Bülow's Prussian corps. One second. Sorry. Berlin, but was held at Lakau by von Bülow's Prussian corps. On the 2nd of June, with both sides strained to breaking point, Neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which, to the surprise of many, Napoleon accepted. The armistice of Plaswitz would last more than two months period of intense diplomacy and military mobilization by both sides. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry, a shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. But he also wanted to keep Austria on side, 
which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops, even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter, That's right. Louise, in 1810. Austrian Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich, who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, now took center stage. Metternich wanted peace and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained, but not crushed, which would hand too much power to Russia. In June, he traveled to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions, while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join them. But Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. Is he gonna, is he gonna... He would not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria, agree to the repartition of Poland, or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. All. I know it's about to explain it, all right? I know that. But what are you thinking, Napoleon? What are you thinking? I, maybe like, you know, his, his, one, the last of his close friends died, and maybe he's just sort of melancholy, just screw it. It's either total victory or total defeat, but that's just stupid. We're out of the question. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war lie in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. So that's cool. These are the two guys. Is this a real painting? So this is uh, the um, head of Austria and the head of uh, France. But Napoleon preferred war to what he called a humiliating peace. I, I, I'm not sure which way he means that. Does he mean that whenever an emperor attacks in person that the emperor's side is is expected to be to lose? Or is it that expects the soldiers to fight harder and therefore you to lose because he's with them? On the 12th of August, 1813, Austria joined the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. The Allies now had a numerical advantage of three to two, and a new strategy, the Trachenberg Plan. Recognizing Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor. Sorry, Napoleon, you're good, but you're not that good. Not and this good. Target his marshals, threaten his flanks, and wear down French forces until it was time to close in for the kill. Over the next few months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain, including eight million pounds in silver and gold coin, 200 cannon with transport. How are you gonna transfer that much weight if... American joke. <laughs> 120,000 firearms. I'm sorry. 18 million rounds of ammunition. 23,000 barrels of gunpowder, 30,000 swords and sabers, 150,000 uniforms, 175,000 pairs of boots, 1.5 million pounds of beef, biscuit and flour, and 28,000 gallons of rum and brandy. There we go. The total value of Without the last one, it would all be useless. British aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. A lot of Today, weight. Worth around half a billion dollars. Napoleon, meanwhile, I'm sorry. turned Dresden into a major supply depot. Wait, how much worth pounds. today? Today, worth around half a billion dollars. Wow. Napoleon, meanwhile, had turned Dresden into a major supply depot and strengthened his cavalry arm 
though it remained a pale shadow of its glorious past. Murat returned to lead it, his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish Portuguese army at the Battle of Vitoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to oh, Suchet. I like Suchet a lot. salvage the situation. On the 15th of August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat the joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia, commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, soon to win the nickname Marshal Vorwärts, Marshal Forwards, for his aggressive leadership. But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Napoleon then received news from Marshal Saint-Serre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching, and the city and its supplies were in danger. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blücher, and raced back to Dresden, sending Van Damme's first corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. By the time the Allied assault began, enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counterattack. Struggling through mud and heavy rain, Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's second corps, broke the Allied left flank and took 13,000 prisoners. Hold on. And heavy rain. Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's second corps, broke the Allied left flank and took 13,000 prisoners. The Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule. Don't take on Napoleon in battle. But news sooner. Now I understand the meaning of the quote before. Arrived that turned the situation on its head. Marshal Oudinot had resumed his advance on Berlin with 66,000 men. But in three days of heavy combat around Grossbiren, he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Some of the most savage fighting was between Napoleon's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Three days later, at the Katzbach River, Blücher inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal Macdonald, driving some French troops into the river itself. Macdonald lost 30,000 men, three eagles and a hundred guns for Blücher's 22,000 Imagine casualties. how brutal the fighting is at this stage of the war. I don't mean that obviously all the fighting during the war was brutal, but just towards the end of the war, you see most of the casualties and atrocities of any war, it seems, especially on a large scale like this with so many different nations involved, because people just get either desensitized or just so angry and fed up with all the stuff and, and hatred of, and hating the uh, opposite people that there's just no um, mercy, I would imagine. Almost Three not. days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Kulm and was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks, as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. Napoleon sent Ney to take over from Udino, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denevitz. The Prussians, fighting to save Berlin, held their own, until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favor. Ney's retreat became a rout, with the loss of another 22,000 men. Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned.
in just 10 days. The he Allied can't do everything himself. The plan was working. Napoleon became increased. The Allied plan was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced and advanced wherever he was not. His teenage conscripts were exhausted by constant marching and famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies. Thousands fell sick, thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. Many of Napoleon's marshals advised him to pull back to the River Rhine. But Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. By October 1813, Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in Germany, converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Wellington was crossing the Bidassoa River into France, Two front. the first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years. While the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides and would declare war on France on the 14th of October. When did they agree French to switch? Since years. While the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides and would declare war on France on the 14th of October. Didn't say when they decided to switch sides. I know when they did, it said 14th of October or whatever, um, but <clears throat> it said it secretly, so I wonder when it made up its mind. Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher, who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. But once more, Blücher narrowly escaped him. Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden and was heading for Leipzig. If the city fell, Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine. But instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. He would risk everything in one great battle to decide the fate of his empire and the fate of Europe. Uh. Thank you to all now that I'm like super invested into this series, like I, I, I want more and more just to watch the next episode. Maybe I will today or I'll put it out tomorrow. I did already do the other Russia um, retreat video today. Amazing, like always. Um, this channel is so friggin' good. I can't even, uh, just the way it shows battlefields and, and shows the, the great maps, um, not only on the battlefields, but you know, the map of Europe with all the different armies and, and the fly. It just, it's so good. Such a great channel. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. If you're not subscribed to Epic History TV, what are you doing? I'll see you guys next time. Supporters for making this series possible.